All right, we're almost done. I think we have really two more scheduled lectures, including this one. And we'll do something different next week. Maybe allow you to work on your lab eight and final exam pre preparation. But I'll consult you with that also. OK, we'll talk about heterogeneous systems. This is another really exciting and very hot topic today, actually, for good reason, of course. And, but this is where we are in the lecture schedule. Uh, last week, we covered in-memory computation and predictable performance. How did those lectures go? Guest lectures? Were they interesting? Yeah. Exciting? These are two hot topics also, again. Uh, in-memory computation, especially today, uh, there is a big need for it because a lot of the applications are extremely data intensive and bandwidth is a huge bottleneck between the processor and memory. If you think about it, we've designed processors so well that computation is not that big of a problem anymore. But that link between processors and the data store that the processors are supposed to access is really a huge bottleneck. If you can do more on that other side without bringing the data into the computation units, you can get a lot more efficient system performance and energy efficiency. Uh, and Vivek talked about uh, some ideas in achieving that. That's a, in, a, if, in a sense, that's a different kind of execution model, right? That we, we've covered a lot of execution models, but we haven't really covered a, an execution model that combines data uh, and computation together at the same time. So it was an important missing piece in the previous execution models we covered. But hopefully, hopefully you, you got the gist of it. And predictable performance is another thing like that, right? We've designed processors for good performance for a long time, but we really need some more guarantees going forward. I mean, in some cases, the guarantees are really clear, right? When you design an airplane, for example, you really want some predictable behavior, robustness in terms of both reliability as well as some predictable performance you get, right? Uh, safety critical systems in general require predictable performance. But even in general purpose systems, wouldn't it be nice if we actually had predictable performance, right? Uh, and this becomes an issue when you have multiple things sharing those resources, especially. And Lavanya talked about some ideas on how to achieve predictable performance. And both of these are going to be increasingly important uh, in the near future, actually. You'll have to deal with it, for example, when you go to industry. I, I believe regardless of whatever company you go to. That's, if, if I'm wrong, you, you can tell me after you graduate. <laughs> okay. So today we'll go uh, more into multi-core issues, and we'll cover especially heterogeneous multi-core. And the last lecture will be on interconnection networks, unless we d decide on some other lecture. But first, let's cover some administrative things. You all are excited about having midterm two on Friday. Who's not excited? OK, just, just two? That's, that's good. <laughs> I, I take it that everybody else is really excited about this, which is fun. I mean, it's going to be fun, hopefully. Uh, and you know the location is the same. The time is the same as before, except it's on April 24th, so we don't need to travel back in time. Uh, and again, uh, the, the rules are the same also. Please arrive five minutes early and sit with one seat separation. Except that what's different is you get two cheat sheets. So you can actually combine or create two new cheat sheets if you want, or you can actually combine your past cheat sheet with a new cheat sheet. And the exam will cover everything we've examined so far. And it's really everything, lectures, labs, readings. But the focus will be on lectures 17 through 30, 30 sec, 32, including this one, basically. So that's really half of the course, right? So hopefully that clears up. But there is a review session we'll have on Wednesday. On, uh, that's April 22nd. So please come prepared with questions, especially on concepts on lectures. I'm less worried about questions on individual exam questions, for example, I assume that you're actually doing those questions on your own. They're detailed homework and exam questions. And we actually have the solutions to all of them. And in fact, some detailed solutions in many cases, right? So I think it's a better use of the time during review if we cover the concepts that you, ha that you have questions about or maybe struggling with than going through a detailed nitty gritty of each of the questions, because that may take a long time, right? Uh, and you can, uh, you're definitely more than welcome to study those on your own and ask TAs during the office hours. Okay. Any questions? Who, who doesn't want to have a midterm review session? Wednesday. There's no one. That's good. There are some suggestions for midterm, too. I think I've already given you this. But definitely solving the past midterms and finals on your own, especially questions that we have, we are going to uh, have uh, 
we're, we're going to potentially have on the exam lecture topics from lecture topics 70, uh, uh, of lectures 70 through 32nd, should definitely try to do those. And there are, there, are, there are a limited number of questions. You have a lot of time. You can actually solve all of them. And you can actually check your solutions versus the online solutions. And the questions will be similar in spirit, as you know, right? And all of the exams are actually online. And I, I also recommend doing homework seven, which is due, when is it due? I guess it's due next week, right? So it's due, oh, 29th. Yeah, that's right. It's, I guess it's due it's still next week. I would still suggest doing th those questions because some of those questions are actually uh, in, on topics that are, that are related to the exam, except for the interconnection networks questions. And the, I mean, you, you already know this, so I'm not going to go through this in detail. Buzzwords, do people find the buzzwords useful? Yeah, they're useful. That's, that's good. Yeah, that has been the feedback we received over time in this course. So we'll keep putting those buzzwords. And do people find the slides and videos useful? <laughs> OK, that's good too. And I guess this, this goes without saying, studying hard. That's, that's why you're taking this course, right? That's one of the reasons, at least. And also, we, we posted uh, stuff on Piazza, which you're aware of. Lab 8, uh, I want to go over the rules for Lab 8. Remember that you're not going to be able to use lab late days lab for Lab 8. It's still due May 1st, but we're going to accept submissions until May 10th. So feel free to submit until that time. Is that fair? Yeah? So you can submit May 1st, but you can also submit any time after that. And after that, we cannot accept any submissions because we need to give grades, unfortunately. Unless you don't want a grade. <laughs> OK. But this is going to be an exciting lab, actually. How many, how many of you started this? Uh, you have started? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the handout time is due is Sunday, uh, uh, May 12th. Oh, is that what it says? OK, sure, yeah, we can, we can change that. I, I don't. I guess we changed it. So May 3rd, how about this? Is this good? <laughs> so you get extra two days thanks to him. <laughs> OK, so this is cyclone modeling of the MESI protocol, as we've discussed in class. Uh, well, I guess this is what, 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 it, what this means. Oh, this makes more sense. Now we have coherence across this line and this line in the on the slide. And that's what you're going to do in your lab also, right? Coherence across two lines and different caches that happen to belong to the same block. OK? And this is what we're going to, you're going to implement. So hopefully this will be exciting. And this is, I mean, it won't be an easy lab. It will be a challenging lab. But I think um, going, going to school at CMU is all about challenging yourself also, right? So hopefully it should be fun. But you'll definitely get to understand the MESI protocol. Before I move on, I'll remind you that for 47 policies, there is no collaboration on labs, including Lab 8. <laughs> right. There is no form of collaboration. You cannot discuss your design. You cannot code together. No code reviews also. You cannot ask your. There is a good reason for it, so that you can actually learn on your own. Right. Basically, all labs on, and all portions of each lab has to be your own work. And I'd like to keep that. If I don't want any violations of this. Otherwise, it can get messy. Right? So just focus on doing the lab yourself alone. And you'll learn a lot more that way. But if you want to have another course for collaboration, we have another one <laughs> for 740, where you can exercise all of those skills of teamwork, collaboration, and everything. By the way, you can do the homeworks together here. That's fine, as long as you submit your own write-up. Uh, but if you want to collaborate on a lab or on a project, 740 is the next course and sequence. And I've already covered this. I'm not going to go over this in detail. But the project itself is a research slash implementation project, which can be done in groups of one through three. So I can actually have a group of three. And in the past, in one rare case, I think I've allowed a, a group of four as well. But then they did a bigger design than everyone else. OK? One more note related to the labs. Now that we're almost done with the labs, this is kind of hindsight node. But Lab 8, I think, is particularly important in this sense, because you will need to test your own code a lot. Well, you, we won't provide a reference simulator for you for Lab 8, actually. But we already provide a reference simulators for you for Lab 6 and, I believe, Lab 7. Uh, 
well, if not for lab seven, we will if needed. Uh, but the goal is really to aid you in going forward in the design, right? In real life, this is to just to set the reality in a little bit. In real life, unfortunately, there are no reference simulators. Actually, that's kind of a lie. There are reference simulators after you, after you design the hardware and you actually build the simulator. Now you have that uh, reference simulator that's hopefully validated. But if you're doing a new design, there are no reference simulators, right? We've covered this when we talked about simulation. So do not expect it to be given and do not rely on it too much, right? Because the reference simulator may be incorrect also sometimes. Right? In the end, the architect designs the reference simulator verifies it, tests it, fixes it, makes sure there are no bugs, and ensures the simulator matches the specification if there is no hardware that actually uh, ha implements that behavior. Right? So what you're doing is really real life in the end. And I, I hope this will be very valuable when you go out. Uh, but you still have the reference simulator for lab six and lab seven, I think. And I, one of you actually have found, has found a bug and got some extra credit for finding that bug which is a good thing. <laughs> so do not expect it to be given and do not rely on it much, right? Because the reference simulators may have bugs too. That's actually true in real life too, right? Even existing hardware has bugs, right? We already covered uh, some examples. That said, let's talk about lab six grades. This is a curve I like to see. Hopefully exam will look like this too, right? <laughs> I, li I like the unimodal distribution almost. <laughs> So congratulations. Uh, and hopefully lab seven will look like this too, uh, at least to most of you. And if you're here, no worries. Hopefully you'll get up there. Again, if you actually fix the problems and uh, show us that you fix the problems, that actually counts as some good credit. Maybe not extra credit, but good credit, <laughs> whatever that means, right? <laughs> and there will be some extra credit recognition. Stay tuned on this one. We're just running a little bit late. And many of you submitted extra credit, actually. So there will be quite a few of these recognitions. And there will be a special recognition for lab four and five. I think this is lab four and five, right? Yes. To Terence, who actually implemented limited out of order execution. Right. It wasn't full out of order execution, but <laughs> still good. <laughs> you want to say something? <laughs> I just didn't want to do the actual lab. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Well, you did, that's, that's why you didn't get credit for the actual lab, but you got extra credit for this, <laughs> for your effort. And it worked, right? Yeah. That's good. OK, let's get back to lecture. Uh, any questions on this? All right. So today, we'll cover heterogeneity. Uh, and we'll talk about, first, heterogeneity in system design. There are, reason, there are good reasons for it, as I mentioned. And this is a very hot topic, hot area today. And I believe systems going forward will be increasingly more heterogeneous. And you already see this happening, right? You already see your CPU and GPU integrated together, for example. Uh, you already see different kinds of memory appearing, like some, some, kind, some kind of DRAM that's really fast and some kind of DRAM that's relatively slow. Uh, and you already see, I guess, uh, what uh, kind of the topic that we will talk about in ARM's big dot little architecture, which is kind of a marketing term that I don't necessarily like, but it's a, it's a form of heterogeneity, right? So we'll talk about heterogeneity, especially applied to multi-core systems and handling serial and parallel bottlenecks better. But basically, we'll build up to heterogeneous multi-core. But let's talk about heterogeneity uh, in general first. I mean, this is a very, very broad principle, right? It's also called asymmetry. And I'm going to use them interchangeably. They really have the same meaning. Right? And contrast this with homogeneity or uh, symmetry. Right? It's really a general system design concept and a life concept as well. Everything we see in life is heterogeneous. Right? Pretty much everything, actually. Uh, so the key idea is instead of having multiple instances of the same resource or same thing, to be the same, or in other words, homogeneous or symmetric, design some of those instances to be different, heterogeneous or asymmetric. It's a very simple idea. Right? And these different instances, what makes this interesting is these different instances can be optimized to be more efficient in some ways, perhaps in executing different types of workloads, for example, or satisfying different types of requirements or different types of goals. So in this sense, heterogeneity really enables 
customization or specialization. If everything was the same, it would be customized perhaps for one thing, or perhaps for the average. That really doesn't exist. Right? But if things are different, maybe you actually specialize those things for different purposes. Right? In the extreme case, everything is customized for exactly the, let's say, workload it's executing. Right? That's really an extremely special purpose design. And I'll have another slide on that. So why do we want this? And you've already seen this in many cases in this uh, class, right? Uh, different workloads executing in a system can have different behavior. That's one reason. And the second reason is you're really designing a system for multiple metrics at the same time. Let's take a look at the first one. So different applications clearly can have different behavior, right? Uh, random access versus streaming is a very simple example, right? They clearly have very different behavior. Different execution phase on, of an application can have different behavior. Over time, an application can change. And the same application executing at different times can have different behavior as well, right? due to input set changes, for example. You run one application with one input set, it finishes right away. You run it with some other input set, it goes on forever. Right? And dynamic events also, cache behavior, for example. What is cached at that point in time? So what is this behavior? Well, I've listed a bunch of things over here, but you can imagine other things, right? Locality, for example, predictability of branches, instruction level parallelism, data dependencies, what kind of instruction level parallelism you can exploit, data level parallelism, right? Bottlenecks in parallel portion. Different applications have different serial fractions, for example, right? So that's hopefully very clear. And this clearly motivates a design that's heterogeneous, right? If you, if you optimize a system for serial execution, let's take this one, serial execution, the design you have will hopefully be something that actually extracts serial performance very well out of that, maybe data flow. Right? Whereas if you optimize uh, a system for completely parallel execution, maybe the design is really, really a very large number of WIMPy cores, WIMPy execution units, right? very small execution units, instead of a data flow machine that tries to extract irregular parallelism with all of those complexity associated with it. So this clearly motivates heterogeneity. And the second part also motivates heterogeneity uh, because uh, systems are designed to satisfy different metrics. And in fact, whenever you're designing a system, there's almost never a single goal in design, right? You may say performance is your own go only goal, but that's not, that's not true, right? Even, even the government has cost in mind, for example. Per you may have, unless you have infinite resources, you have to have at least two goals. I guess that's, this could be a law someone came up with at some point, right? The law of design. So usually it's, let's say, performance and cost, right, at the same time. Performance and energy and cost at the same time. Performance, energy, cost, reliability at the same time, right? And all of these are actually goals. Maybe one of them is a little bit more important, but you have to satisfy all of them, actually, if you want to be successful, right? And these are some of the metrics that I just put over here. Right. And you can think about it not at the system level, but also at a subsystem level too. Right? Whenever you're designing, let's say, a cache, you have similar goals. Right? Performance, size, latency, cost, energy. Right? So systems and subsystems have these two properties at the same time. So both, this also motivates asymmetry because a design that you optimize for performance, let's say for serial execution, is very di different from a design that you optimize for cost or energy efficiency, right? A data flow processor may not be the most cost efficient design for energy efficiency, uh, or, or, or the en most energy efficient design either, right? So the problem is the symmetric design is one, si one size fits all, right? It basically tries to fit that single size design to all workloads and metrics. The pro and Again, the problem is it's very difficult to come up with a single design that satisfies all workloads, even for a single metric. And we just discussed this. And that satisfies all design metrics at the same time. If you come up with this, then you'll probably win the Turing Award. But I don't think you should try to work on this problem. <laughs> it's very difficult, right? That's, people have been working on this, right? General purpose processor design is an example of this. People are trying to design general purpose processors for a long time. And even the general purpose processors we have today are asymmetric internally. As we've seen, right? You, you don't have just a scalar portion, but you also have the extensions, the SIMD extensions, right? These are really two different execution models combined in one system. 
even, even, if, even if you don't talk about GPUs today. OK, so this holds true for different system components or resources. And I'll, I'll, uh, I'll encourage you to think about different resources, cores, caches, memory, controllers, interconnect disks, servers, data centers, okay. and algorithms and policies as well. Right? So this is a picture that I like showing because it kind of clearly illustrates. Basically, if you look at a symmetric design, you can think of this as any resource, any general resource. It's one size fits all. right? If you think about workloads that have different behaviors, this particular resource is probably energy and performance suboptimal for different behaviors. For example, if, you're, if, if the resource is too much, then you're really wasting energy. If the resource is too little, then you're not utilizing. Uh, then you're not getting the best performance you can. Whereas if you actually design something like this, that looks like this, that have different kind of computational power, let's say, over here, and you can think of any resource. Think of cores, for example. Uh, now you can enable customization and adaptation, right? When the processing requirements vary across workloads, applications, or phases, you can try to execute the code on the best fit resources. If the code uh, requires a large core, you, kind of, you, you basically ship it to this large core. If the core requires parallel execution, you enable all of the cores such that, that, parallel, uh, that those threads actually execute at the same time in all of these resources. So hopefully, this can get you minimal energy with adequate performance or with higher performance than this one. Right? That's the idea, basically. And you can think of this as caches, memory control. I'll give you examples. So we've already seen many examples before in this course. We're going to focus on something. Cray-1 design. Who remembers the Cray-1 design here? Nobody? You do. That's good, yeah. Basically, we ha they, it had scale and vector pipelines. And what I told you at that time was even though it was a vector machine, it was the fastest scalar machine of its time, right? Modern processors, we just talked about this. It has, they have scalar instructions plus SIMD extensions. Decoupled access execute. It's a very good example of this, right? You have two pipelines that are different. One is optimized for access, one is optimized for execute. And Jim Smith, when he designed, he realized that these actually have two different requirements, right? Even though the goal was also enabling instruction level parallelism, you can think of it as a heterogeneous design, right? Thread cluster memory scheduling, you probably remember that also. Different memory scheduling policies for different thread clusters to optimize for fairness and performance at the same time, right? Heterogeneous refresh rates, that's a heterogeneous policy, right? Instead of having a single refresh rate, why not have multiple different refresh rates? Hybrid memory systems, and you can imagine other things too. So I'll just go through this so that you remember. Right? These are all heterogeneous designs. There are examples from life too. I think I, I don't want to take the analogy for too much, but life is really heterogeneous too. Like humans are heterogeneous. You're, you're, you're not all the same, right? Definitely not in space or time. Cells are heterogeneous. I think biology is a really interesting example, for example, right? They're specialized for different tasks. Not all the cells, are, organs are heterogeneous. Cars are heterogeneous. You don't, it'll be pretty boring if everybody had the same car, right? Kind of interesting to think about it, though. <laughs> Buildings are heterogeneous, like this one. Rooms, and anything you can imagine, right? So it's basically uh, true for both nature and human-made components, too. So there's another way of looking at it. It's really what I told you before, general purpose versus special purpose, right? Asymmetry is really a way, or heterogeneity is really a way of enabling specialization. It bridges the gap between a purely general purpose design and a purely special purpose design. So what is purely general purpose? You have a single design for every workload or metric. Purely special purpose, you have a single design for per workload or metric. Right? Basically, you have many, many designs in this case. right? Asymmetric, you have multiple sub-designs optimized for sets of workloads uh, and glued together. Hopefully, you don't have a design for every workload, a separate design for every workload, but a design that kind of can cater to sets of workloads, right? some characteristics. And you glue those multiple designs together and hopefully get the best of multiple worlds. Basically, the goal of good asymmetric design is to get the best of both general purpose and special purpose. That's another way of looking at it. Right? Any questions? I can think about the other concepts that we've applied uh, before. You can have a special purpose vector processor, 
versus a special purpose scalar processor, right? Relatively special purpose. If you put them together, you're really combining two, two special purpose things, right? And hopefully, that kind of bridges the gap between the general purpose versus special purpose, right? OK. So let's take a look at general advantages and disadvantages of asymmetric design. Right? I think I've told you the advantages. Basically, you can, you can enable optimization on multiple metrics at the same time. You can enable better adaptation to workload behavior, because if a workload actually fits this particular, let's say, DRAM at that point in time, you actually steer it towards that DRAM. If a workload actually requires uh, this other particular memory, let's say phase change memory at that time, because it requires non-volatility, let's say you steer it towards that memory. Right? That's one example. And the workload behavior can change. Right? It can also provide special purpose benefits with general purpose usability and flexibility, because you, ha you still have general purpose design, but you have special purpose components in it. What is the disadvantage? Anybody? Complexity, yes. That's basically you have higher overhead and complexity in design in the end, right? And verification and anything that ensues, right? You have higher overhead in management of the re resources, right? Because now you have multiple different types. If you have a single type of everything, you have no choice, right? So management is easier. You still may need to manage other things like interference between those uh, same components, but Management is a harder problem now. Now you need, to you need to have a mapping or scheduling problem. How do you pick the best resource to execute a particular thing on? Well, there's one more thing, right? There's also another kind of overhead, which is overhead of switching between multiple components. If, if behavior changes dynamically, now you, need to, you may need to, to, to be able to do good mapping. You may need to switch from one component to another component. Let's say you have a large core versus small core, right? You figured out that large core is not buying you benefit, but it's really burning a lot of power. Well, you need to switch that application from the large core to the small core. And that takes time. That costs energy. And you need to have mechanisms for this. So this can actually lead to the degradation of the metrics that you're trying to optimize for. Right? So overheads definitely need to be taken into account when you're, having, when you're designing an asymmetric system. Anything else? In particular, asymmetric systems can have their own overheads. I'm going to reduce this a little bit here. I don't want to black it out. OK. That looks better. Okay. So yet another example, which we've talked about, actually. Modern processors, a lot of modern processors integrate general purpose cores and GPUs today. These are CPU, GPU systems. And you can think of this as heterogeneity in execution models, right? You, could, you can have heterogeneity in execution models today, as you did 40 years ago in Cray 1. OK, any questions? Now let me go into a deep dive. But before that, I'll talk about like three key problems in future systems. And I think this is relatively clear based on what you talked about in this course so far. Memory system is a huge problem. Efficiency is a huge problem. Efficiency, including performance and energy efficiency, because that actually limits your scalability, limits the new applications you can design, and maybe limits the new usage models you can have. And predictability and robustness are problems also. Hopefully, those are clear based on what you talked about in this course, right? You had a lecture on predictable performance, but we've also talked about unreliable hardware, right? Uh, resource sharing and unreliable hardware both cause quality of service issues and maybe security issues too in the end. Uh, you can think of security as a quality of service problem also, right? If, if someone hacks your system, you have no quality of service from that hardware. Uh, basically, these are first class constraints going forward. And I will posit that actually asymmetric designs can, can help solve these problems. And we've seen it in the case of memory system. We've seen it briefly in the case of uh, core design. And I think predictable systems can actually fix this problem also. For example, you can have reliable DRAM versus unreliable DRAM, right? We briefly talked about this when we talked about the memory system. If you have reliable DRAM that's high cost versus unreliable DRAM that's very low cost, maybe you can do a better mapping of the application such that only when you need reliability, you actually use the reliable DRAM that's expensive, right? I don't know if that'll work for all applications, but 
It may work for some applications, right? Maybe you don't care about the reliability of a pixel on your screen, right? Maybe you don't care about the hundredth search result that you get when you use your favorite search engine. Make sense? OK, so we'll, we'll focus on this part first. And we'll focus on the multi-core design. So this will be relatively focused in terms of how you can actually architect asymmetry when you're designing multi-core systems. Because multi-core systems, when they were first designed, did not, were not symmetric. We're not asymmetric, right? And many of them are still not asymmetric. So let's talk about multi-core design. Uh, this is kind of a trend that we have today. Not, maybe not necessarily the best trend, but people are putting more, more and more cores on chip. And this is, there are good reasons for it. There are upsides and downsides. We're not going to cover the upsides and downsides in detail. But you can have simpler, uh, you, can, you can have simpler and low power cores than a single large core. More scalable, hopefully, right? It's a lot easier. It's, hopefully it's clear that it's a lot easier to design a simple core and stamp it out and connect them somehow than design a, uh, design a core that can actually execute uh, a single threaded program extremely fast. Right? And we've, we've seen the scalability bottlenecks in out of order execution uh, and data flow machines. So there's good reason for having multi cores. You get large scale parallelism on chip. Right? It's exciting, actually. Basically, it's multi processors on the same chip. It's enabled by Moore's law, which never seems to end. <laughs> OK, so what do, what do you want with many cores on chip? Basically, you want to get n times the performance. I think I've shown you the slide before, right, when we talked about resource interference. Ideally, you, when you, put, uh, you want linear scaling of performance as you put more execution units. Right? That's what Amdahl's law actually tries to quantify also. Right? And when you paralyze an application on n cores. Unfortunately, what you get is really Amdahl's law, for example, serial bottleneck. If you have a serial portion of your program, even if it's 0.0001%, you're limited by that portion in the end. Right? This doesn't hold. And you can guarantee that you'll have a question on the exam related to this. <laughs> and we have bottlenecks in the parallel portion, too. And do you remember what those are? There are three of them. You can probably guess that there will be a question related to this on the exam, too. <laughs> See, I'm giving you all the exam questions again. <laughs> I shouldn't do this. <laughs> yeah? Yeah, synchronization. Resource contention, load imbalance. That's right. Resource contention and load imbalance. Those are three fundamental bottlenecks in the parallel portion, in addition to the serial bottleneck. And this is the beautiful equation that you have come, uh, come to love, right? And you may see it again. And I think I've shown you this, basically, this caveat of parallelism. Maximum speed up that you have is limited by serial portion. You have the serial bottleneck. And parallel portion is not perfectly parallel. And we've talked about most of parallel computer arch architecture is about fixing these issues, right? And also doing it while ensuring that programmers don't go crazy, right? So this, this, this slide is really fun, very fundamental to multiprocessing or parallel processing. So the problem is. Many parallel programs cannot be parallelized completely. So you, you're inevitably, you will have serialized code sections. And these are the, uh, we've, we've actually also seen some cause of serialized code sections, right? Sequential portions. This is where only a single thread exists. We've seen critical sections, barriers, and limiter stages in pipeline programs. If you go back a few lectures, I've actually showed you, uh, shown you this at least twice. And the problem with these serialized code sections is they reduce performance. Because when one thread is holding a lock all of the other threads are waiting for, then you're actually not, you're, you're actually not uh, exploiting the performance potential that your system has. They limit scalability. Basically, they limit the number of threads that you can execute to achieve the maximum performance you can get in a system. Right? Scalability is what is the maximum number of parallel threads that you can have that lead to the highest performance. And you always have a maximum number. And the curve usually looks like your scalability increases and then reduces. Actually, not the number, the, uh, that number increases and then reduces. Let me do this. 
okay? That's the switching overhead in heterogeneous systems, right? That is useful for one purpose, this is useful for another purpose, and when you switch to the other one, you have an overhead. So fundamental, amazing. Right? <laughs> I guess you could, we could have reduced the switching overhead if I had a tablet over here. Right? It's still a heterogeneous system. OK, basically, we've seen this. Uh, right? This is number of threads, let's say. And this is speed up over one thread. And we've seen the speed up curve, and it usually looks like this, actually. <laughs> right. Well, you cannot see it, or you can see it. And basically, this is your scalability, or where the performance actually bottlenecks. That's the maximum number of threads. And after that, your performance goes down because you have other overheads, right? As you add more threads, you can have more resource contention. Synchronization becomes a bigger problem. And I'll show you, actually, uh, in a little bit. If, if when you're adding threads, all you're doing is adding more weighting and more ping-ponging of locks and shared data between the caches, then your performance reduces. If when you're adding more threads, what you're doing is adding more resource contention, more robo for conflicts because more threads, then your performance can go down, right? And also load imbalance, right? When you add threads, if your load imbalance increases, your performance again can go down. OK. So that equation, uh, this part uh, over here manifests itself in that portion of the curve. But it's also present in all of these portions, right? You can actually get better performance as you increase the number of threads if you actually handle those parts well. OK. And you also waste energy. I don't have the energy curve for that also, but your actually energy consumption increases if you have these serialized code sections, because a lot of threads will be twiddling their thumbs waiting for other threads to finish, for example, if, if there is a synchronization bottleneck, or if there is a serialized code section that bottlenecks performance. So this is one example, uh, very high level example. Uh, and this is a really old. How many of you have used MySQL at any point? What's the data? Oh, you have used it? You like it? It's much better now than, I don't know, 10 years ago. <laughs> it's a database, basically. And databases are an important data-intensive application. Uh, basically, if you abstract the behavior of this, of a thread in MySQL, when a thread comes, basically when a request comes, let's say, you open some tables in database. Uh, you perform some operations on, that, on the database tables. And let's assume that this part is really parallel. Because once you open the tables, you get the locks for the portions of the database you're accessing. And you can actually parallelize these operations with, across different threads that are actually accessing different parts of the database. Right. Opening database tables, unfortunately, is relatively serial. Now you can parallelize this also. But you can think of this as uh, accessing a critical section where you're getting the locks for particular uh, rows and columns in a database, depending on how you operate on the database. Okay? And you need to actually have a critical section for this, because what if two threads are trying to access the same row, and you want to give it to one, only one thread, because they're going to actually update that, and the updates need to be atomic. Right? For that, you need to have a critical section for this. And this is the impact of that critical section on the performance of a MySQL application running some sort of request. Right? Basically, if you, as you increase the chip area, your speed up increases this way. At some point, it starts going down, because this part becomes a bottleneck. And other bottlenecks start uh, happening also, like ping-ponging of the locks. right? Because to access the critical section, you actually need to get the lock, access the shared data, which is that open tables cache. And if you have more threads or more cores, now you have more caches to ping-pong or travel between. That's the synchronization latency, actually, communication latency. I'll show you asymmetric designs that can actually make this much better. So this is a symmetric design. That's today. And this is an asymmetric design. So you can actually, and I'll give you the idea, basically. You execute the critical sections on a large core. It's a pretty simple idea, right? If you actually do that, you can actually achieve much better scalability. So here, the performance actually saturates around 17 or 16 threads. I don't know the exact number. Here, the performance actually saturates around 32 threads. It looks like it's around 36 cores, but it's really 32 threads over here. And you'll see why. 
that we discussed. Does that make sense? Well, we'll see, we'll see how we can actually achieve this. And actually, the results, if we get to it, uh, uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll tell you some ideas on how you can actually do better than this. So this is kind of the potential of having an asymmetric design. If everything is the same, you get the scalability bottleneck. But if, if things are different, now you can handle the critical sections in a different way, right? Because this is really your bottleneck. And when they become a bottleneck, you can ship it to a really fast core that can execute them faster. You can even imagine cores that, that are specialized for critical section execution, right? Now, we're not going to do that. We're going to be more general purpose. But that's the potential of an asymmetric design. So basically, what I'm getting at is you have different demands in different code sections. If you look here, this parallel part probably wants lots of small processors, right? assuming you have lots of parallelism in the database. And hopefully you do, right? lots of requests. And this serial part, this critical section, probably wants a core that can actually quickly get out of that critical section. Basically, this is what I said. In a parallel code section, you probably want many wimpy small cores. Right? And you can design those really easily. But in a serialized code section, you, can, you probably want a powerful large core. Unfortunately, these two design goals actually conflict with each other. Right? If you have a single powerful core, you cannot have many cores. Because, because single powerful core, you need to dedicate a lot of area, a lot of energy, and power consumption. And you're limited by both of those today. A small core, on the other end, is much more energy and area efficient than a large core. Right? Let me give you some kind of numbers. What do I mean by a large core versus a small core? Well, you can think about the large core as an out of order, a, a very beefed up out of order execution processor. Right? A lot of the concepts we've discussed can go into the out of order core. Right? Memory dependence prediction, for example. Right? Trace caches, for example. Hardware forming. Hardware doing trace scheduling internally. Think about it that way. Right? And it, could, it doesn't have to be four byte. It could be much wider, right? deeper pipelines. Small cores are wimpy cores, in order, narrow fetch, shallow pipeline. Maybe you don't even have a branch predictor. And we will see multi-core designs where you didn't have a branch predictor. Sun Niagara, we talked about fine-grained multi-threading. Right? One of the earlier multi-core designs actually didn't have a branch predictor. It really had these wimpy, wimpy cores. And large cores, unfortunately, are power inefficient. And this is kind of a rule of thumb. Uh, I believe this was actually Polak's law, uh, or, or something like that. Don't quote me on that. But there's a law related to this saying, with 4x the area, or slash power, you get 2x the performance. It doesn't have to be, that doesn't have to hold, but it's kind of a good rule of thumb that, has, that industry has seen. And this is one paper that actually talks about something like this. Uh, basically, they quantify uh, the. Uh, the power consumption and kind of performance of large cores versus small cores. If you look at this, large core is an out of order core with 128 or 256 entry reorder buffer. This is the width, this is the pipeline depth. So it's normal, uh, and this is the small core, wimpy core. And its normalized performance for the large core is 5 to 8x. It's actually pretty. <laughs> and you can see that this is relatively wishy washy, right? It really depends on the workload in the end. But normalized power is not necessarily wishy-washy because you actually design these cores. And that could be very high for a large core. So if you want power efficient execution, you probably want small cores. But if your workload doesn't fit, that doesn't provide you power efficient execution because your workload will, not, will run forever. right? And this is the normalized energy per instruction for the large core. So there is a huge difference between a large core and a small core, a WIMPy core, in terms of both performance and energy. And after, you, after you're done with uh, 447, I would definitely recommend that you read this paper. It's called Best of Both Latency and Throughput. It's a short, relatively short paper. So let's talk about uh, these large cores and small cores. There have been two. Uh, I'm not going to talk about all the multi-core designs in the world. That's, I guess that could go on forever. <laughs> uh, maybe not forever, but uh, for, for a long time. Uh, but I'm going to talk about how the industry approached this uh, when, when, when they figured out that uh, scaling a single core design is not as easy uh, in the uh, circa 2000 or so. One example is IBM. So when IBM first started, actually IBM's multi-core designs are one of the earliest. And this paper is actually a beautiful paper that talks about both the design as well as the system architecture. Uh, basically, this was this is yet another symmetric multi-core chip, similar to what we've discussed earlier, right? Intel, Pentium D, and but this was actually earlier. 
If you look at it, what they did was they put few and more powerful cores right, compared to the Niagara design that we discussed earlier. I, I'm actually going to go back to uh, the Niagara design. I should probably fix these slides because I reordered the slides. <laughs> but basically, if you look at this core, uh, this design, it has two cores. And each core is pretty hefty. Like it, uh, each core has a 100 end instruction window, eight white fetch, issue, and execute, large branch predictors, large caches, and aggressive prefetching. Basically, it's, it's really a large core, two large cores put together. It's a symmetric design. And IBM Power 5 actually uh, took this a, a step further by adding simultaneous multi threading on top of that, right? You know, fine grained multi threading, we didn't go into simultaneous multi threading. If you take 740, we'll go into it in more detail. But basically, Simultaneous multi-threading enables an out-of-order execution machine to be able to fetch from multiple threads. If you see, you see two program counters over here, two different instruction buffers, two different history tables or return address stack, two different reorder buffers, for example, here, and two different store queues. And you can actually dispatch instructions from different threads at the same time, concurrently to different functional units. Right? And we've discussed this. Out of order execution actually has all of this machinery, so you don't actually ch need to change that. So IBM Power 5 was still a symmetric multi core chip, very hefty out of order core. Let's look at the small part, the opposite end. Sun was another company that was designing multi cores, and this is one of the earlier multi core chips as well. And you've already seen this uh, when we talked about fine grained multi threading. But basically, they had eight small cores over here, and each one was four way fine grained multi threaded. And we'll look at the pipeline a little bit, but this is kind of the system design over here. So they put more effort into this part, basically the memory part, which may be a good idea. But this may be this may become a bottleneck if the cores are too wimpy. Right? So basically, this is the Niagara core. It's four-way fine-grain multi-threading. It's six stages, dual issue in order. And we had discussed at some point that it had round-robin thread selection, unless there's a cache mess. So you can see the thread selection logic over here. And it even had a it didn't even have a floating point unit, if you look at this. Basically, it had a shared floating point unit among cores. If one core needed to do a floating point operation, it needed to arbitrate for that shared floating point unit. So this tells you how important, how, how wimpy the core is, right? Well, I'm not going to go into the detail, but a little bit of history. Sun later added the floating point unit because they figured out it's a bottleneck. <laughs> so they have a floating point unit per core. That's Niagara 2. And then eventually Sun got bought out by Oracle. And th these are Oracle designs that are actually heavy cores right now. <laughs> That's another lecture on multi-core. But remember the demand. What we want is, in a serialized code section, one powerful large core, like maybe IBM Power 4. And in a parallel code section, many wimpy small cores, like Sun Niagara. So the reason, uh, Actually, there is a good reason why these companies went this way. Right? Sun Niagara, actually, the goal was to design for parallel performance, server performance, commercial workloads. And they, their, their, their thought was these workloads have very high thread level parallelism, and instruction level parallelism doesn't matter that much. That was kind of the thinking that they had at the time, and which was maybe overall true for the workloads. On the other hand, IBM was designing processors for uh, banks, for example. right? And there were a lot of serialized code sections. So they, they, ha they wanted to get good serial performance while having also reasonable parallel performance. Right? So there were, there were actually good design goals that motivated these different types of uh, designs at the time. But neither, neither of them was a good fit for what actually people are trying to achieve in the end. Right? In the end, you don't, unfortunately, the code you run is just not par always parallel or just not always serial. You really want these two different kind of cores at the same time. And that's the idea of having asymmetric multicore. Basically, can we get the best of both worlds? Right? Let's do some analysis. And I, th I think the idea is clear. right? Instead of having the same core replicated all over, uh, regardless of whether or not that core is large or small, we'd like to have asymmetric cores. Let's do some analysis. Let's assume that small cores, a small core takes an area budget of 1 and has a performance of 1. And a large core takes an area budget of four, basically four times the size of the small core, and has a performance of two. That's the square root of root law, basically. As you increase the, uh, basically the, the, uh, the performance that you get 
from an area that's times n is square root of n. That's. So this is the tile large approach. Basically, this tile has a few large cores, and these are the designs that you can take a look at. The upside is high performance on single thread and serial code sections. Assuming these things over here, the total area over here is 16 small core area, right? Or 16 units. And the performance you get on the serial code sections is really 2, right? Assuming what I said, right? The large core takes an area budget of 4 and has a performance of 2. The serial code section can be executed only on one core. By definition, it's serial. And its performance is 2 in this case. That's the upside over here. We'll see why it's an upside, because if you actually have this tile small approach, the performance of the serial part is only one, right? Because the serial part can execute on only, only one core. Okay? The downside of this approach is it gets low throughput on parallel program portions. Now assume that uh, you get a performance of two on each core. You can run four of those, and you get eight units of performance, right? That's two by two times four. It's pretty simple. Well, this tile small approach has the advantage when you have parallel part, right? You get high throughput because you have one, uh, you have 16 small cores that can provide you one unit of performance. So your performance in the parallel section is really 16 units. Make sense? And these are some of the examples. Actually, I haven't updated the slide, so some of these don't exist. Intel Larrabee, for example, was a design that was an alternative to GPUs. I guess it, is, it kind of exists right now. It's kind of transformed into this Knights X designs. Uh, but basically, uh, they had many, many small cores. And tile area tile is time, kind of tile ultra small. The cores are even wimpier than the uh, uh, Niagara cores. But basically, tile's large approach is good for serial code sections, but bad for parallel code sections. Whereas tile small approach is good for parallel code sections, whereas bad for uh, serial code sections. And I kind of this uh, showed you this. And one of the problems with the tile small approach at that time was you can actually have reduced single thread performance compared to existing single thread processors, right? If you go really wimpy cores and you don't provide anything else to execute your serialized code sections on, is if you have serial code, serial code, you actually reduce the performance, right? That's a bad idea. That's a big no-no. You never provide the programmers a uh, a hardware design that reduces their performance. Right? And that's one of the reasons why this actually didn't succeed as well as some of the other approaches. Right? If you look at it, all of the designs, you don't find tile small approach as prevalent today. Right? For example, Oracle moved into heavy out of order cores. It's really tile large at this time. Right? Even um, like Spark, for example, they, they had in-order processors at that time. Uh, they actually moved to out-of-order cores. OK. So basically, the idea is to have both large and small on the same chip and provide some performance asymmetry. Right? And we're going to talk about performance asymmetry. You can actually think about functional asymmetry as well, like CPU, GPU designs could be functional asymmetry and also performance asymmetry at the same time, but they are programmed in different ways. Here, we're going to talk about cores that are programmed using the same execution model but have different kinds of performance. So that brings us to asymmetric multicore. Basically, what we're talking about is something that looks like this. This is one example. You can use the same area budget of 16 to divide your area this way. Have one large core of four area units and 12 small cores. Right? Now, the upside of this is now, if you have a serial portion, you get the performance of this. Basically, you execute the serial portion on the large core, and you get two units of performance. If you have a parallel portion, you almost get the performance of this. Maybe not perfectly. Basically, you execute the parallel part on the small cores as well as the large core. And what you get in the end is 12 plus 2 units, right? Because you have 12 small cores and one large core that provides you 2 units of performance, 14 units, right? Well, that sounds like a good deal <laughs> because you're really getting the best of both worlds. And if you really want the performance of this tile small, maybe what you do is you actually make this large core choppable into pieces. Right? If you can actually, whenever you have parallel part, you can do multi-threading on the large core. Maybe you actually get 16 units at that time. right? You can have four threads on the large core. And people are actually looking into that 
people call this kind like morph core, for example. If you can morph a core into a large core when you have serial execution, and a multi-threaded core when you have parallel execution, then you can actually get the performance of four small cores with a single large core. Okay? So there are ways to actually, hopefully, get the performance of small cores when you have a large core. The other way is a little bit harder, right? When you have small cores, how do you get the performance of a large core? You kind of need to glue them together such that they operate like a single large core. But that's actually, people have actually looked at that. This is called core fusion. There are research proposals related to this. And it's a very interesting proposal, but it turns out it's a, it's a difficult proposition to actually glue cores together, especially if they're in order cores. It's very difficult to glue in order cores together such that they operate in an out of order fashion. Okay. So basically, how do you extract single uh, serial bottlenecks? If you have a single thread, execute them on the large core. So this is the picture that I have shown you at some point, or at, uh, at many points. You have a single thread, ex execute on the large core. When you spawn lots of parallel threads, well, send them to small cores as well as the large core. right? And they keep executing. And when you have a single thread again, go back to the large core. Right? So hopefully. You will, modify, uh, you will minimize the effect of the serial bottleneck on your execution, because now your serial bottlenecks are sped up by two compared to having all small cores. Does that make sense? OK. So this are, these are the assumptions that we had before, right? Let's take a look at the analysis just a little, little bit. This kind of summarizes the analysis over here. This is a tile large approach. This is a tile small approach. This is a, ACMP, asymmetric multi-core, asymmetric chip multiprocessor approach. And this is the number of cores that you have. Assuming, the equ assuming an equal area budget. Right? This is all uh, the assumptions that your area is equal. There may be other assumptions, assuming an equal power budget. right? That kind of changes what you design, maybe. But if you look at this, uh, this large core, well, uh, this uh, asymmetric multi-core gets the best of both serial and parallel performance, right? Well, in this case, it's not the best, but I, I just told you that you can actually do multi-threading. Now, let's not assume you have multi-threading over here. Maybe you lose a little bit of performance in the parallel case. In the end, in many applications, this turns out to be a good deal. Not in all, because you, losing parallel performance in a very parallel application may not be a good idea, right? So always, it's a better idea to strive for uh, getting the best of both worlds. Maybe let's derive this equation right now. Let's, basically, you can mod modify Amdahl's law for this heterogeneous multicore, right? Now, Amdahl's law doesn't hold, kind of, right? Well, it holds, but you need to modify it. Let's, let's do that over here. This is kind of simplifies Amdahl's law for an asymmetric multiprocessor. I guess I have a, how about this? That sounds better grammatically for some reason. <laughs> okay. So assume that we have a serial portion executed on the large core and parallel portion executed on both small cores and large cores. And maybe I'll draw this over here. I have to go back and forth. Remember, the speed up that we had with Amdahl's law before was this, right? One, uh, what did I call? I guess f is the parallelizable fraction of a program. If you have homogeneous multicore, this is the speed up that you get, right? N is the number of cores. F is the parallelizable portion of the program. Basically, you do not speed up the serial part, but you do speed up the parallel part perfectly. That's the assumption of Amdahl's uh, law. And we're going to keep that for now. Uh, and now assume that we have heterogeneous multicore. We have L large processors and S small processors. And X is the speed up of a large processor over a small one. Now, this is your new Amdahl's law. Compared to the above, basically you can modify the above really easily, right? One, now your 1 minus f, the serial part also speeds up, right? And it speeds up by x. Why does it speed up by x? Because you have, one, you have some large cores that provide x speed up over a small one. Right? And uh, you can execute the serial part only on one large core. So that's the speed up you get compared to uh, a, a, a single small core. Right? I, I guess I should really uh, 
uh, specify what is the comparison point, right? A small core. And that's a single small core. On the other hand, your parallel part also speeds up as you add more cores. And this speeds up by the number of small cores, because they give you kind of one unit, plus the number of large cores times x. I guess I should call it x, Lx. Right? Because each large core gives you x units of speed up compared to a small core. Right? And this is your new speed up curve. Well, this is your new speed up equation. Now you can draw curves by changing x, l, and s. And maybe we'll do that later on. Becomes interesting, right? Now you don't have just n. Now you have x, l, and s. And you can imagine how things will behave. Because depending on f, you probably want different values for l and s. OK, I'll let you think about this uh, a little bit. Actually, you should probably look at some quest uh, questions that we have uh, on the homework, as well as past exams, to really think about this. OK. Any questions so far? Does this make sense? Yes? This is a speed up after Amdahl's law, right? So yeah. the modified law is a speed up from, the norm, from like many processors to having big and small. No, this is the speed up compared to a single small core. If you have S small cores and L large cores, where each large core provides you x times the performance of a small core. OK? Oh, so the small core is the same like if you had, that's the same small core as if you had a single small core. Exactly, oh. yes, exactly, yes. That's the basically, that's the, the, the basis of the execution time of, is that, uh, that small core. Okay. No other questions? So everybody can answer good questions related to this. OK. So let me actually talk about this slide, and then we'll take a short break, because we're going to switch to something else. Basically, this is the speed up, assuming you execute the serial portion uh, on the large core. right? But remember, we always have caveats on the parallel portion. And this is the old Amzal's law, but you can replace it with the heterogeneous part. So parallel portion is also not perfectly parallel. So can we do something about it? So in the next part of the lecture, we'll also, we're going to talk about accelerating parallel bottlenecks. Instead of just shipping the serial part, we're going to try to ship the synchronization bottlenecks to the large core as well. And this actually gives you even more scalability. Because now you can actually speed up these parallel bottlenecks instead of just the serial bottleneck. And your parallel bottlenecks actually may be even more important in some cases, right? When you have a lot of synchronization, for example. OK. Let's take a break over here for, let's say, four minutes. Let's be back by 1.38 Singapore time. But don't be as sleepy as you would be in Singapore right now. All right, I guess let's get started. Remember, this, this thing that we developed over here is still idealized, right, in terms of the parallel part. We still assume that the parallel part, OK. I see it correctly. Oh, that's a different way of looking at it. We still assume that the parallel part is perfectly parallel over here. But that's not the case. Right? So M extending MDAL's law to actually handle those bottlenecks in the parallel part is actually much, is a, is a difficult, relatively difficult modeling and research problem. It's not clear how you would model all of these synchronization bottlenecks, uh, load imbalance, as well as, uh, now, I, now you, you, you will test me, right? With the resource contention, right? These are actually relatively difficult to model. Um, if, if you want to add that. It's not as easy as, oh, this part is serial, this part is parallel. Right? Serial and parallel is very, relatively easy, assuming you can get those numbers somehow. But it's difficult. What is resource contention? Right? That really depends on what else is running with you. Right? And maybe the state of your caches, your input set, a lot of different things. OK, let's talk about accelerating parallel bottlenecks. Uh, serialized or imbalanced execution, these parallel bottlenecks uh, in the parallel portion can also benefit from a large core as well, right? Examples are critical sections that are contended, for example, or parallel stages that take longer than others to execute, right, in, in a pipeline parallel program. And the idea that we will talk about is, can we somehow dynamically identify these code portions that cause serialization and execute them on a large core? That would be nice, right? That way you can get out of that critical section. And this is the uh, paper that I will base my discussion on, 
But this is uh, something that's important to understand because it really goes into uh, the fundamentals of parallelism again. So take the ideas, but maybe the implementation that is provided here is not the best implementation. But it's always good to think about how you can accelerate the critical parts. But let me motivate that first with a simple example. Like, wh why are critical sections important? And why, why is contention for these critical sections important? Let's assume a program that has 12 iterations. And in each iteration, 33% of the instructions are in a critical section. Let's assume you run it with a single thread. This is what the execution time looks like. right? Single thread, critical section. Yes, you execute the critical section, but nobody else contends with it. That's good. Let's assume you run it with two threads. This is what happens. Basically, you have two threads. When one is in the critical section, the other cannot be in the critical section, so it waits. But now you can overlap the critical section execution in one thread with computation, non-critical section execution in another thread. So you gain a lot of performance. Right? That's the benefit of parallelizing. Even if you have some critical section, you actually gain a lot of performance by having two threads. Now, this wouldn't have happened if 100% of the instructions were actually executed in the critical section. right? you wouldn't gain any performance. Actually, you would probably lose performance because now you have overheads. Now, if you actually increase the number of threads to three, this is what, it, what the execution looks like. And this uh, x-axis is the execution time over here. Basically, you gain some more performance. Why do you gain more performance? Because now the threads uh, can overlap computation with critical section, right? non-critical section with the critical section. And Going from two to three threads actually improves performance, again, significantly. Now, one thing to notice over here is now at any point in time in this three thread execution, at any point in time, there is one thread that is executing the critical section. Right? So going from three threads to four threads actually doesn't improve performance. It just adds more waiting. Why? Well, because, because of what I said, right? At any point in time over here, there is a thread in the critical section. If you add one more thread, you cannot overlap non-critical section, the parallel part, with the critical section anymore. Right? As a result, you just add more waiting. And this is even optimistic, because this doesn't assume that there are other overheads. Right? Other overheads meaning now you have four threads. Now they contend with each other in resources. That's one overhead. The other overhead is now you, you have worse locality of locks and share data because now you have more ping-ponging across the caches. So actually, in most realistic situations, going from three threads to four threads would degrade performance. But I don't show that over here. But that's the key uh, observation here. Basically, this version of the program that you're running with three threads is now limited by the critical section. The critical path of execution goes through the critical sections. Right. So if you actually add one more thread, you're not going to gain performance. Now let's take a hypothetical case where we can magically accelerate the critical section by 2x. Let's see what happens. Now the single thread execution improves performance, which is good. Two thread execution, you get better performance as well, because now your critical sections are shorter. Three threaded performance, again, you get better performance. And if you look at this, your three threaded version is not limited by the critical sections. Your critical path is not only through the critical sections. right? If you add one more thread over here, you can actually improve performance again, because you can overlap critical section in one thread with non-critical section in another thread. Right? Basically, if you look at the three threaded versions, you actually improve scalability. Before, if, you, if the critical sections were taking two time, uh, twice longer, the maximum number of threads at which performance saturates was three. Now, if you accelerate critical sections by two, not only your performance improves, but the maximum number of threads where performance saturates becomes four. Your scalability improves, right? Now, you can actually utilize more cores in a better way. Does that make sense? So that's the key idea, basically. Accelerating critical sections increases performance as well as scalability. So let's talk about how we can do this, actually. Uh, well, we've already, uh, before that, let me recap a little bit. Basically, contention for critical sections leads to serial execution. right? And that's what we see over here. In the end, you're really serializing execution because you have contention for critical sections. And contention increases with the number of threads on limit scalability. Let's go back to this MySQL before. And this is the reason where you have the scalability bottleneck. 
right? Scalability problem. Performance saturates here. So if we can somehow design an asymmetric system that ships the critical sections to a large core or magically accelerates them, you can actually get to overcome that scalability bottleneck. So you can argue, let's say, who, whose job is this, right? Uh, let, let's assume that we want the execution time of these sequential portions, serialized sections, to be short. One can say, punt on the programmer, right? Somehow the programmer fixes this, such that the critical sections are short, right? Is that a good idea? The answer is it depends, right? If you have a wizard programmer, maybe it's a good idea, right? And that's what a lot of the database companies have been doing for decades, right? They have these wizard programmers that go and optimize those locks. And they're very, very good at doing that because they've done it for 40 years. So that's one way, one approach. Even if you do it, even if you can do it with those wizard programmers, there is variation in hardware platforms. You can optimize it for one sort of hardware. Maybe it doesn't run as well for some other kind of hardware. That's one of the reasons why some of these companies want to ship full systems, right? They don't want to ship just the software. They want to ship the hardware and the software optimized together. Maybe you've seen Oracle servers, for example, right? That's one of the reasons Oracle actually wants to design processors as well at the same time as the software they design. Because they can co op co op optimize everything across the stack. That way, they don't have variation in hardware platforms for their software. And also, there's limited resources, right? What if you don't have these wizard programmers that can actually reduce the critical sections? You can also say, you can actually have heterogeneity, but you can also, you, 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 you make it the job of the programmer to ship code to different, uh, different execution uh, models or different cores, let's say. Now, that makes it a little bit easier, perhaps, but still now the programmer needs to figure out when to actually use the large core or the small core. So that, that's actually still slow. It would be nice if actually the system automatically does this somehow automatically figures out that there is a serial bottleneck in the code that's really bottlenecking your performance and ships that serial bottleneck without requiring any programmer effort. You can think of this as kind of out of order execution, right? Again, it's, very, it's, it's the trade-off that we've been examining in this course over and over, the programmer architect trade-off. In order execution, terrible for programmers. Now the programmers need to optimize code somehow easy for the architect. Out of order execution, great for the programmers. The programmer doesn't need to think about performance as much. Bad for the architect, right? Same here. You have an asymmetric multi-core that automatically ships serialized code section, identifies serialized code section, and ships them to the large core, as opposed to the programmer doing this. OK, so how do we do this? That's the idea of accelerated critical sections. Now that I've given you the idea, the rest is really how do you actually implement it? Basically. Hardware and software cooperatively ships critical sections to a large, powerful core in an asymmetric multi-core architecture. What are the benefits? It hopefully reduces serialization due to contended locks, critical sections. It hopefully reduces the performance impact of the hard to parallelize sections. And programmer hopefully doesn't need to optimize parallel code. Right? And this leads to hopefully improved productivity for the programmer and fewer bugs. Because remember, when we talked about multiprocessors, you can always improve the performance of your code, but you're always risking adding more bugs into, uh, into, into your program. That was a fundamental trade-off also. Let me give you pictorially how this works. Basically, we have this asymmetric multi-core, one large core, three small cores in this case. And uh, you have this buffer that's called the critical section request buffer. Basically, whenever a, a, a small core gets into a critical section, it's going to ship a request to the large core saying, large core, execute this critical section for me, because it's important. And we want to get out of it quickly. Right? That's the idea. So somehow, assume that your program is marked. You have an enter critical section and leave critical section signal. And you have this critical section that you do something over here. Let's assume pro uh, process two, processor 2 enter encounters a critical section, which is demarcated by a critical section called instruction. So we're assuming that we're modifying the ISA over here. Processor 2 sends this critical section call request to the critical section request buffer in the large core. And large core at some point executes the critical section in this FIFO queue. That's the first in first out queue. Basically, all of the critical sections are executed in order. While it's executing the critical section, it, this processor 2 waits 
It doesn't have to wait. If you are multi-threading, for example, that processor 2 can do something else. And when the processor 1 is done, it sends a critical section down signal to the requesting core. And then processor 2 continues with execution. Right? Sounds nice, right? It's actually very similar to, again, server client programming model. right? This is a server that's servicing critical sections. And this, these are clients that are servicing, that are basically sending requests to the server. It's really distributed uh, system programming, again. And the critical section request buffer are the function calls that are to be executed by the server. Right? If you've done distributed programming, you're actually doing something like this. Does that make sense? OK. So how does this work? Uh, again, briefly, this is, let's assume that this is the code uh, that is written to be executed on a small core. You do some computation. You generate some input. And then you have this critical section that takes that as input and produces a result. This is a function call, let's say. And then eventually prints that result. Now, how do you actually execute this on an accelerated critical section system? Uh, you need to modify the code a little bit. And some, somebody needs to do it. Uh, it can be the programmer, which may or may not be a good idea. But it can be the library also. Assuming programmer uses libraries to actually do parallel programming. For example, if you have a locking library and you use that library all the time, maybe the compiler can actually emit code that looks like this. Right? That's one of the benefits of using libraries. You can always design a compiler that takes that library and emits code that actually works for the system you have in mind. Right? So let's assume that the library takes that lock and actually somehow identifies the inputs and outputs. And Basically, when the small core executes the portion, it pushes the input parameter, input argument, to the critical section on the stack. And it generates a critical section call instruction starting from lock address x with a target program counter. It sends, when this gets executed, the critical section call request gets sent to the large core. And what is sent to the large core is x, which is the lock address. The program counter, the target program counter, the stack pointer, and the core ID that's requesting the execution. You can think of this, again, if you've done distributed programming, these are parameters that are marshaled together with the function that you want the server to execute. Right? This is called data marshaling. Right? You're really marshaling the parameters to the server to be executed. And if you haven't done distributed programming, I would definitely recommend that you take a course related to that. Because a lot of the system programming is that way today. Right? And maybe internally, processors will be that way too. OK, so when the large core receives this request, it enqueues that request in its FIFO queue, the critical section request buffer. At some point, that becomes the oldest request, and the large core starts executing it. What does this mean? Basically, it starts, it sets its program counter to the target PC, it sets its stack pointer to the stack pointer, and first acquires the lock. This is to ensure that not, no semantics of the program changes, and then pops the uh, input parameter, and there could be multiple input parameters that are communicated across the stack. And then it executes, uh, basically, this is what the code looks like at the target program counter. Right? It basically does the critical section call. It pushes the result of the critical section on the stack. It releases the lock, and then executes a critical section return instruction, right? which basically sends a critical section done response to the small core saying, small core, I'm done with the critical section execution. And the small core, at that point, pops the results because remember, the communication happens across the stack between the two cores and prints the result. Does that make sense? So with minimal modifications, you can actually enable this kind of execution at fine grain with hopefully low overhead. Right. Now you can imagine doing this purely in software also. Right? You can imagine actually adding all of these purely in software and actually send, uh, starting a thread on the large core. That makes the programming a little bit harder. If, if this is all transparent to the software, that's relatively easier. Well, purely in software, if you don't want to modify the hardware, then you don't have any critical section call instructions. right? How do you do that in software? That's something for you to think about. It's actually doable, but with more overhead. Right? You can actually run a server on the large core, assuming you have a large core. Even if you have a small core, you can actually run a server that executes critical sections. And you can have clients that are requesting the server to actually execute the critical sections. Right? You can do that today. And you can see what kind of performance benefits you get. Actually, other people have done it, and they've, they've shown good performance results. Uh, 
But the overheads of that is much higher, right? Because now you actually do communication in the software. OK. Any questions? Is this interesting? Yeah? <laughs> well, this is the future that you will need to deal with at some point, right? This is, well, this is actually what you deal with when you actually program in, with locks. And you really want a mechanism that accelerates the locks. So one of the problems, I'll very briefly talk about one of the problems of doing this. This is not, this is not always good for performance, right? What if you're sending lots of critical sections to the large core? Then it becomes a problem, right? Why? Because you can actually have false serialization. Because all of these cores, small cores, are executing critical sections. One of them is executing critical section A with one lock. Another is executing critical section B with another lock. These are totally independent normally, assuming the program is correct. If they both send these critical sections to the large core, now the large core executes them serially, right? But that doesn't make sense because these critical sections are actually protecting different shared data. They have different locks. You run into the problem of false serialization, unfortunately. So how do you actually fix this? You can actually fix this problem. I'm not going to go into detail. But one thing you could do, for example, is to figure out when you're falsely serializing critical sections. Let's say the large core receives critical section call to A. Uh, it basically decrements a counter. It receives another critical section called to A, it decrements a counter. And this counter indicates how many times you have falsely serialized this critical section. Meaning, how many times you couldn't execute this critical section because you had some other independent critical section that was executing on the large core. And if you get a critical section called B at this point, this cannot execute because there are other critical sections in front of it. And those other critical sections are actually different. If this critical section actually stayed in a small core, it could have executed, right? So you increment this counter saying you falsely serialized critical section called B. Right? And at some point, when this counter reaches a threshold greater than some, or reaches a value that's greater than some threshold, the large core can say, oh, I don't want your critical section because I'm doing the wrong thing with it. I'm falsely serializing it with some other independent critical sections. Make sense? This problem you have in, again, server client programming models also. If you overload a server with uh, lots of function calls, potentially to the same function or different functions, you get the serialization problem with that server, right? Any questions? So you can think of this as, so when you do server client programming, you really do a remote procedure call, right? We've talked about this. It's a good buzzword, for example. You're really doing a remote procedure call on a server. And this is really happening on chip now. You're really doing a remote procedure call on chip. When you execute a program on a GPU, it's again a remote procedure call on a GPU, right? Uh, you, the CPU prepares uh, the program. It prepares the parameters and sets up the memory and then says, tells the GPU, execute this program. That's really a remote procedure call to the GPU that the programmer is doing. Now, that would be also nice if that was all done by the system, such that the programmer doesn't deal with that, right? Have you guys done GPU programming? Yeah? Wouldn't it be nice if someone did that for you, right? Exactly, yeah. It's exactly the same thing. It is nice if someone did that automatically for you, if someone automatically accelerated the critical sections for you. OK, let's look at the performance trade-offs. So whenever you have an idea, there are always pluses and minuses. Pluses I'll give you. Oh, I gave you all of them. <laughs> so one obvious plus is faster critical section execution, right? And we've, give, we've, we've seen the benefits of this. Higher performance, hopefully higher scalability. But there's another benefit to this, which is your shared data locality is much better if that shared data stays in the large core, right? Remember, if, if you actually execute the critical section on different cores at different times, you actually need to move the lock and the data to the caches of those different cores. So if you have, uh, this is core 1, I guess core 0, core 1, core 2, core 3. Basically, if you execute the same critical section on, uh, I'll do it this way, critical section uh, on, on core 0, you first need to bring the lock over here and then bring the shared data that you're touching. Now, if core 1 executes that critical section, you need to bring the lock back and maybe part of the shared data over here. Now, if core 2 executes it after this is done, you need to bring the lock and bring part of the shared data 
and dot, dot, dot. Basically, that's the ping-ponging problem, right? Whereas if there is only a single core that's executing the critical sections, that lock stays here, and shared data stays here also. So you get better shared data and lock locality, right? And maybe it, make, it may also make sense to make the cache of this large core large, right? It doesn't make sense to have a wimpy cache on a huge core. So hopefully you have a larger cache that can accommodate that locality well also. So this idea actually may make sense even in symmetric multi-core processors, right? Executing the critical section in one place because you get the locality benefits of keeping the lock and share data. What are the minuses? Yes? Yeah. So basically, someone needs to delineate the critical sections, right? So you need to have some, something that marks the critical sections, critical section call instructions. And you can do that assuming you have libraries. But I think your question is, how do you actually ensure that you can execute all the critical sections? So if you look at uh, this design over here, you need to have a critical section request buffer. And that needs to accommodate all the critical section requests that come. And if you have a limited number of critical sections that are executed, let's say you have 15 processors over here, or 12 processors, you can have this 12 entries, right? And you can limit that. What if the That's right. Now you need to actually increase the size of that critical. But then you can always uh, do, you can always deny NACA requests, right? This increases complexity. But you, the large core can say, oh, my critical section request buffer is full. So go and execute it on your own, right. just like you're handling false serialization. So you can actually design the hardware, hardware that works without, without provisioning for the worst case. OK. So implementation complexity, yes. <laughs> That's one downside, actually. Whenever you add something like this, there's more complexity, right? You need to get it working correctly. What else? May or may not, depending on what your comparison point is. Why do you think that way? Uh, that's what, so the, since it uh, executes the critical section sequentially, so having beyond a certain number doesn't make any sense. Yeah, so basically, I think the false serialization can become a bottleneck, right? If you have many critical sections that are independent, your false serialization can become a bottleneck. That's absolutely true. And that's one big downside of this. But maybe you can have multiple servers then, right? Maybe multiple large cores makes, may make sense. I don't know that yet. What else? Well, I guess I've given you again all of this. But large core is dedicated for critical sections, right? And that actually reduces your parallel throughput. Now, you can again fix this problem also, right? Maybe by having multi threading. Let's say you have multi threading and you execute your parallel part as well as critical sections on the large core. But now your critical sections are not accelerated as fast because they contend with other threads that are executing on the large core. right? So there is a trade-off that you get over here. It's not like the previous thing that we see. If you have an asymmetric multi-core, you can actually have multi-threading on the large core, and the parallel part can execute nicely over there. If you dedicate the critical sections, if you, if you, if you ship the critical sections to a large core, if you also want to use that large core for other threads that are not in the critical section at that point, then you slow down the critical section. Right? You slow down the other threads too, but the critical section is potentially more important. OK, so if you dedicate the large core for critical sections, you get reduced parallel throughput. Right? You have a question? OK. So there's also the other transfer overhead. Right? You somehow need to, if you think about it, there's another way of thinking about it. Uh, you're really shipping computation to a server here. And how you're doing that computation shipping is by sending the critical section call request right, to the large core. And there's some overhead in doing that. right? Instead of bringing the lock and shared data to your core, you're really shipping the computation to the large core. And that incurs some overhead. And also, the response incurs overhead too. So there's a trade-off. Right? Uh, and also, 
Now, what, about, what happens to the private data? Remember this uh, private data, this input data that we had into uh, the critical section? Well, you need to push it on the stack. You kind of need to ship it to the large core. right? So the large core kind of pulls it. Right? So now private data doesn't stay in the small core, but it really has to be transferred to the large core. Basically before, uh, remember this was the uh, shared lock and shared data. It was ping-ponging. We kept it over here. Now we're making a trade-off. If you have private data, before the private data of this thread that's executing here was always staying here. The private data of this thread that's executing here was always staying here. This is data that's never accessed by some other thread. Now you need to ship the private data over here to the cache of the large core. Right? When the critical section executes, you, this pr private data needs to move from here to there. Right? So it's kind of a trade-off. You're reducing the uh, cache misses due to shared data, but now thread private data needs to be transferred to the large core. Yes? Are you saying reduce private throughput because the time it takes to ship and all? Oh, you mean this one? Because, yeah. No, because you cannot execute threads on the large core. You, you cannot execute threads that are not in the critical section on the large core. Okay. Now, you can, but then there's a trade-off also over there. OK. So let's take a look at these performance trade-offs a little bit, uh, because it's, it's really interesting how the trends uh, change. Right? You can think of how the overheads. So basically, because you have a large core, you have fewer parallel threads, because the large core is dedicated for critical sections. That's the downside. The upside is the large core is accelerating the critical sections. Right? You lose some parallel performance, but you gain some parallel performance too. And this is all, always in the parallel part. You lose some parallel performance because the non-critical parallel performance reduces because you can execute on fewer threads. But hopefully, critical section performance increases. Now, it turns out, according to the results, accelerating critical sections offsets the loss in throughput in many workloads. And if you think about it, as the number of cores or threads on chip increases, the fractional loss in parallel performance decreases. Let's, let's think about it this way. If you have an area budget of uh, 16, and you're dedicating four of it to the large core, you're really losing 4 divided by 16 of your parallel throughput compared to all small cores. right? Now, if you have an area budget of, let's say, 128, and you're dedicating 4 of it to the large core, now you're losing 4 divided by 128, which is about 3% of your parallel throughput. So trends are such that, hopefully, you're not losing as much as if you have a large area budget and a relatively small large core. And increased contention for critical sections actually makes acceleration more beneficial. Because as you add more threads, you have more contention for critical sections, as we've seen right, in the previous example. So as you add more cores or threads on chip, it makes more sense to dedicate a, a core as a server for critical sections. Let's, take a look, let's analyze the other overhead and upside. The overhead was shipping computation, shipping the critical section call and critical section down signals over the interconnect versus keeping the lock in the large core. Right? If you can think of it, lock is you can either ship the data, which controls the computation, or you can, sh either sh you can ship the computation. So it, it turns out accelerating critical sections avoids ping ponging of locks among caches by keeping them at the large core. Right? And this is actually not bad. Uh, because this, it turns out this is a little bit more important. Because you can always overlap the shipping of the computation. Right? Why can't you overlap the shipping of the computation? Because if, the large, if your critical section is truly contended, that's probably true that some other, uh, that large core is executing that critical section. And while you're shipping your critical section over there, you're not on the critical path. That critical section call or done signal doesn't really affect your critical path. That's the, that's the interesting thing about contention. If you have contention that's on your critical path, maybe you can add some more overhead, like critical section call, that ships computation. And that is not on the critical path, because somebody else is on the critical path. Right? And you're waiting for that somebody else. And if, you, if you're not contended, if that's not a content critical section, maybe you shouldn't ship it anyway. Right? Because that may not be important. That's not your critical path. Right? So the other uh, trade-off. Here is you have more cache misses for private data. Right? Again, if you look over here, the private data needs to go to the large core, whereas before it was staying in the cache of the small cores. So you lose locality of this private data 
Because when you need it next, you get a cache miss over here, right? And when this core needs it, maybe it gets a cache miss also. So you have the ping-ponging of the private data. But that private data is limited to one core and the large core, hopefully, that ping-ponging. Shared data, on the other hand, uh, actually stays over here. So hopefully, it never gets transferred over here. As a result, you get very good shared data locality. Right? So which one is more bigger? This is actually a tougher one. Right? Do you have more private data or more shared data in programs in a critical section? Yes? That's right, yes. That's what you would hope. And I agree with you. If the programmers were, again, wizards, you would have very, very little private data. But it turns out that's not the case. If you take many programs, there are some programs where the critical section has lots of shared data, very little private data. But sometimes the programmer is conservative, and they have large critical sections, and they include stuff that's not supposed to be included in the critical section, ideally. So you have a lot of private data that goes into that critical section. Right? So ideally, you would probably have very little shared data. And let me actually illustrate why that makes sense, ideally. Let's assume uh, this is actually a, an example we've, we've seen earlier, kind of this kind of a dynamic tasking structure. You have a priority heap. Let's say uh, this is the heap, uh, or you can, you can think of it as a task queue. Threads can actually take stuff from that task queue and actually uh, solve problems. Let's say you created some new problems. You want to insert into the shared queue. Now, this is your shared data. Assume that that's huge, right? And your critical section, you need to do this in a critical section because you're really updating the shared data structure. You have one piece of private data, and you need to touch lots of pieces of shared data to be able to insert this one piece of private data. Intuitively, your private data should be smaller than your shared data, right, according to like this, and this kind of shows that intuition. Because your shared data structure is relatively large, you generate some private data, and you update your shared data structure. And while you're doing the update of the shared data structure, you're actually touching a lot of shared data, because you want to figure out where to insert this. But you're touching only one piece of private data. So intuitively, this trade-off should be better overall, right? And that's true in most programs. But in some programs, actually, you have a lot of private data that kind of sneaks into the critical section, because the critical sections are not optimized. That's true for even MySQL. MySQL is much better, by, by the way, today. OK. So basically, overall cache miss is reduced if the shared data is greater than your private data, right? When you're touching uh, the, the, the shared data that you're touching in the critical section is greater than the private data that you're touching in the critical section. But this problem actually can be solved relatively easily, right? Can you guys know why? Or do you, can you guess why? In a sense, it's easier to predict what private data you're going to touch and send it to the large core, right? You kind of know it almost, right? Or you can learn it over time. Whereas shared data is a little bit more difficult. It's not clear what shared data that you're going to touch before you execute the critical section. Whereas before you execute the critical section, you kind of prepare the arguments for the critical section. right? Remember this example that I showed you? You have A, and that gets input to the critical section. Well, when the thread executes and prepares this piece, this element, it can basically ship that element to the large core right? before the large core needs it when it executes the critical section. So in that sense, handling private data is an easier problem because it's easier to predict what data that you produce privately to this thread is going to be used in the critical section versus predicting what shared data that you're going to actually touch in the critical section. Right? Well, again, taking this example, basically we're touching these nodes, these blue nodes in the critical section. But those blue nodes actually de depend on what, those blue no what, the no what the data structure looks like. Right? You don't know which data you're going to touch until you actually execute the critical section. This kind of fundamentally demonstrates why it's harder to predict the shared data. OK. But I'm not going to talk about it. You can imagine mechanisms. So let's take a, I'll give you some performance results, and we're going to end this lecture after that. Uh, so we're going to do some comparisons. So uh, everything we've discussed is not futile, because this is going to improve performance significantly. <laughs> and you can imagine why, right? Uh, we're going to look at this symmetric small core design. We're going to look at this 
asymmetric multi-core design. This is 16 small cores that uses conventional locking. This is one large core and 12 small cores that uses conventional locking, but the large core executes the serial portion. And this is accelerated critical sections. Large core executes not only the serial bottleneck, but also the critical sections. And we're going to ship every critical section to the large core. That's not a, bad, that's not a good idea if you want efficiency, right? Because you really want to identify those critical sections that are contended. And I, don't, I won't have time to go into how to actually do that for contended critical sections. You can do much better than this. And as, as a good architect, whenever you have a good idea, you try to evaluate it with simulation, right? And you need to do high-level simulation. So basically, we're going to examine 12 critical section intensive applications from a lot of domains, as you can see, and with a multi-core x86 simulator. And the assumption is that the large, uh, you have 32 small cores, and the asymmetric multi-core has one large and 28 small cores. You can look at, uh, this, this is basically very similar. The large core is very similar to what we've discussed earlier. The small core is very similar to what we've discussed earlier. Uh, and if you want to do the study right, you've got to model the interconnects and the delays and the caches, right? all of the coherence protocol effects. So assuming you've done all of that, how do you actually do the comparison? Uh, let's look at, we're going to assume a chip area of 32 small cores. Symmetric multi-core has 32 small cores. Asymmetric multi-core and ACS have, accelerated critical sections have one large and 28 small cores. Basically, we want an equal area comparison. But is that enough? How do you set the number of threads for each of these systems? So this is one important thing when you're doing com performance comparisons across different parallel systems. Remember, I showed you earlier that uh, on a conventional system, if the critical sections are not accelerated, the number of threads for that uh, Mickey Mouse program that we looked at, it's not even a program, right? Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the thread that, did, that had 12 iterations, right? Uh, if you actually execute it on a system that doesn't accelerate the critical sections, the best number of threads is three, right? Because going from three to four actually led to a performance degradation. Whereas if you execute it on a system that accelerates the critical sections by 2x, the best number of threads is four. So how do you actually do the performance comparison? Well, the fair comparison is actually setting the number of threads that maximizes the performance for that particular system. Right. You cannot just say, oh, I'm going to take four threads, because that, unfair, that, uh, that unfairly favors one system over the other. You really need to find the best number of threads for a given system for that program, figure out the performance, and then compare that to the best number of threads for another system for that program, and compare the performance. That's a fair comparison. Right. Now, how achievable is this is another question. Right. Who decides the number of threads, right? This is actually a difficult problem also, again, for the programmer. How does the programmer know how to set the best number of threads? When you have an eight-core system and you actually run a program, how do you set the best number of threads? The best number is perhaps not eight, right? It could be six. Maybe it could be 16, if you have fine-grained multi-threading, for example, fast switching. Well. That's actually another problem in uh, par uh, uh, parallel processing. Right? How do you actually figure out the best number of threads you execute a program with? We're not going to deal with that over here. But we're going to assume we know the best number of threads by simulating all of the configurations. Right? So OK, let me give you uh, quickly. Uh, we're going to divide the programs into coarse grain locks. This is where the programmer was lazy, or they weren't educated, or they didn't have 40 years of experience, where the locks were protecting huge critical sections. Right? Or you can have programs with f relatively fine grain locks, where the programmer was actually very good. Well, good, let's say. Because again, you can always go finer grain, right? Uh, where the programmer optimized the critical sections. And this is performance optimized over a symmetric multi core. 100 is, uh, assume that 100 is the performance of the symmetric multi core system. And if you accelerate, and uh, sequential kernels in this, means, uh, in this case means it's the sequential portion, sequential bottleneck. If you accelerate MDAL's serial bottleneck, you get pretty good performance in many of these applications, right? On average, you get about 7% performance benefit. But there are some applications that see around 50% performance benefits because they're actually bottleneck by the serial portion. Now, on top of this, if you also accelerate critical sections, so this is the benefit of ACMP basically. If you Actually, critical sections on top of that with ACS, with the mechanism that I discussed, you get a lot more significant performance benefit. On average, it's about, I guess, 41%. Right? And in some applications, it's ridiculous, because you're really bottlenecked by this critical section. Right? 
In some applications, it's about 2.5x, 2.69x over here, right? Does that make sense? And the benefits that you get on programs where programs were not as optimized is much higher. And this is expected, right? If you have larger critical sections, it's more likely that you have contention for those critical sections. It's more likely that you have serialization because of that. And if you accelerate them, you get higher benefit because they're a bigger bottleneck on system performance. If you have smaller critical sections, like this one, where the critical sections are very optimized, you don't get as much benefit. Right? But on average, you win. Let me go over this, and then we'll uh, conclude. This basically, this is actually what you really need to do when you analyze the performance uh, of these. Basically, each of these graphs is a scalability curve, as we've seen before. right? And x-axis, let's, let's pick one of them. OK, page mine. I don't like that. Let's pick this one. <laughs> this one looks better. Basically, x-axis is the number of threads that you're using. Y-axis is the speed up compared to single thread on a, a small core. Right? Now, if you execute this program, this is the puzzle workload that I kind of showed you over here. It's, it really solves a puzzle. Uh, and this is the MySQL that I showed you earlier. Basically, if you execute this program, I have to see the green curve with a symmetric multicore. If you look at the green curve over here, the performance saturates around nine threads. And the speed up that you get is kind of not so great, right? It's really about three. You're using eight threads, and you're getting a speed up of three. So it's sublinear speed up, as you expect, right? Because you should always question superlinear speed ups. Uh, and using ACMP, asymmetric multicortex serial parts, does not really help because this program actually doesn't have a serial part. It's mostly parallel. Well, it, it has a serial part, but it's really small. Right? So accelerating that, uh, the curve of ACMP overlaps with the curve of symmetric multicore in this case. But if you accelerate critical sections, the curve looks much, much nicer if you look at this. Right? Now the critical sections get accelerated on the large core, and the performance saturates at around 30, 32 threads over here. Right? And maybe it saturates even further if you actually had more cores. In this case, we set the number of threads to the number of cores, basically. So how would you do the comparison of, uh, let's say, accelerated critical sections with SCMP or ACMP here? Basically, you take the best performance on this curve, given an area budget, assuming the area budget is, I think in this case, about 32 or maybe 36. I don't remember. It's 32, actually, not 36. Uh, basically, you take the best performance over here. The performance you get is really about 6x compared to a single, uh, sim uh, single small core. And you take the best performance of ACMP, or let's say SCMP, which is, well, ACMP is more visible over here. So let's take this one. It really happens around here. So it's about maybe 2.3x. So the speed up you get by accelerating critical sections is, I guess, 6 divided by 2.3, right? So you get about a 2.6 speed up. Is that true? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I guess I did that calculation off the top of my head with a lot of rounding. <laughs> but that's basically the speed up that you get. So the speed up is not this divided by this, right? That would be very unfair to this system over here. Because if you know what you're doing, you would not run puzzle with 32 threads on the system with symmetric multicore or asymmetric multicore that accelerates only the serial part. Does that make sense? OK, so if you look at this, basically the scalability of seven of these applications actually improves when you accelerate the critical sections. In some cases, the scalability, they keep scaling like this. This is kind of the best case over here. In some cases, the scalability starts saturating again, but it's much better, much better than a symmetric system. Okay. And I think I'll stop here. This is kind of the summary that you can look at in your free time. Any questions? Any burning questions, I should ask? OK, so you should come up with questions for Wednesday, because we're going to have a review session, unless you want the review session to be really short. <laughs>